the Senate Veterans Appropriations Subcommittee on Military Construction, Veterans Affairs, and Related Agencies will please come to order. We are here today to discuss the fiscal year 2024 budget requests for military construction and family housing from the Office of the Secretary of Defense and the Military Services. This hearing will consist of two panels, the first of which includes witnesses from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, the Navy, and the Marine Corps. The second panel will consist of witnesses from the Army, the Air Force, and the Space Force. Thank you to all of our witnesses for being here and joining us this morning. I'm glad to have you all here, and I'm especially glad to be leading this important subcommittee with Senator Bozeman. You know, as the daughter of a World War II veteran, this work is personal to me. I take serious our nation's obligation to our service members, veterans, and their families. We have to make sure we are meeting their needs and keeping our promises to them. I have worked to do that every day since I've been here in the Senate. It was my top priority when I led the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, and it is my number one focus as chair of this subcommittee as well. I am very glad to have Senator Bozeman as my partner across the aisle. Uh, we have worked closely together on the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee, and I know he takes this responsibility seriously as well. I look forward to working with you on this subcommittee and with all of our colleagues on both sides of the aisle, starting by making sure we continue our progress on returning to regular order, because we cannot keep up with our competitors like China if we let critical investments like military construction fall behind or fall into uncertainty due to partisan fighting. Today's hearing is an important opportunity to assess what our nation needs to stay ready, to support our service members, and keep our families safe. And I'm pleased to see President Biden showing he takes this seriously by proposing significant investments to improve the quality of life for service members and their families, modernize maintenance and training facilities, and make military installations more resilient against growing threats like climate disasters. This budget request increases military construction by more than a third compared to last year's request, continuing a trend of increases that is especially critical after roughly a decade of decline and amid rising construction costs and growing needs. After all, our ships and our submarines, our aircrafts and more are only as good as the infrastructure they rely on, and they are only as well supported as the troops who actually operate them. That's why the investments in this budget are so important. For example, the billions in funding proposed in this budget to modernize our public shipyards. Back home in my state of Washington, the Puget Sound Naval Shipyard is a key naval asset. And I'm pleased to see that this budget includes funding for electrical infrastructure to help it prevent unexpected power outages. I also expect to hear more about the Navy's plans for progress on the multi-mission dry dock at Puget Sound Naval Shipyard, including construction plans to address the unique threats posed to the shipyard by the potential for earthquakes in that area. And of course, earthquakes aren't the only natural disaster we have to be prepared for. Climate change is an urgent national security threat, and if we want to keep our nation ready for anything, we have to make sure our bases are resilient in the face of climate disasters, which is why the funding requested for 30 projects focused on improving energy and water resilience at our military installations is such an important investment. The department should also continue developing projects that enhance installation resilience in the face of severe weather. This budget also includes key funding to strengthen our alliances and partnerships around the world by supporting NATO infrastructure projects and funding to address PFAS and other toxins at former installations that could put our communities in harm's way, an issue that must be dealt with on active installations. And last but not least, there are the investments here focused on improving the quality of life for our service members and their families, like good child care and schools for troops for our kids, or schools for our troops' kids, or good housing or dining options. But those investments really improve our recruiting, our retention, and our overall readiness. And what's more, they're what our troops, troops deserve. They're part of what we owe them for the sacrifices that they make. So I'm glad this budget request includes a boost in funding for troop housing for individuals and families alike, including $100 million for a barracks project at Joint Base Lewis-McChord in Washington State. There is a significant housing gap at the base, and I look forward to hearing more about how this project will help close that. 
I'm also interested to hear more about the Air Force's plans to strengthen family housing projects as well. It is important to me that we are maintaining the housing stock we have and not letting the houses military families are living in right now fall into disrepair. I'm also pleased to see this request includes funding for five new child development centers. We have a child care crisis in this country, and too many parents cannot find high-quality, affordable child care options that work for them. Staffing shortages, worsened by the low pay in that sector and high demand, have made it very hard for families across the country to get child care, and troops are no exception. This crisis is keeping parents out of the workforce and holding them back from pursuing their careers, including careers in the military. I've been pushing very hard to pass my Child Care for Working Families Act because we do need in this country bold change and bold investments to end that crisis nationwide. And as that effort continues, I'm glad to see President Biden understands how important child care is to our troops and to keeping our nation strong and ready for anything. Because at the end of the day, we could have the best equipment, ships, aircrafts, tanks, you name it, but none of it will do any good without the brave and talented men and women who work to keep our country safe. So I look forward today to hearing more from our witnesses about how the investments in this budget strengthen our country and working with my colleagues in a timely manner to pass a funding bill that lives up to our obligation to support our troops and their families and protect our nation. Thank you very much. And with that, I will turn it over to Ranking Member Bozeman. Thank you, Madam Chair. And it's a real pleasure to be with you today as Ranking Member of this subcommittee for our first MILCON hearing together. I look forward to working with you on the important issues within this portfolio. As, as the chair mentioned, uh, we've been on the Veterans Affairs Committee, the authorizing committee for many years. We did some great work there. We're doing great work there and gonna, gonna do some great things on this committee. I would also like to extend a welcome to our witnesses here today and specifically recognize uh, Vice Admiral Williamson, as this will be his final appearance in front of our subcommittee before retiring after 43 years of service. Congratulations to a truly outstanding career. We do appreciate you very, very much and all you represent. I was pleased to see this year's budget request at $16.7 billion, which is an increase over last year's request of $4.5 billion. While it's a 12% uh, decrease from the fiscal year 2023 20 enacted level of $19 billion, it's the highest MILCON <coughs> request seen in many years. Unfortunately, instead of providing more purchasing power, the higher budget is consumed by more expensive projects due to high inflation and large increments. <coughs> it's worth noting, however, that at least some of these increments are additive to the budget instead of pushing out other projects to stay within a flat top line. As we were tracking large increments on the horizon, the fear was they would start to consume the MILCON program. So I am glad to see that some of the increases have a direct correlation to some of the larger increments. However, as I mentioned before, this means the increase in accommodating existing projects, but it is not necessarily allowing us to increase the number of projects. We are also losing our buying power due to inflation. As we are all aware, the construction market has been heavily hit by inflation and other economic disrupt disruptors that are increasing project cost. Unlike the past few requests, whose costs were already outdated by the time we received the budget, this request seems to account for this cost growth. But it came at the cost of other projects. It is clear when comparing last year's plan to this year's request that some projects were sacrificed in order to afford higher price tags on others. That's especially disheartening for a program that is already underfunded and makes up just 2% of the total DOD budget. I'm also still worried about the execution of prior year projects. Even after the congressional increases the past bills have provided to help deal with inflation, there are still many projects remaining with cost disconnects. I think this year's request is a step in the right direction and I hope that future requests continue to grow. But I also look forward to a time that budget increases outpace the continued cost growth of projects. 
I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today and continuing the dialogue and work needed for a successful MILCON program. And with that, Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, um, Ranking Member Bozeman. I will now introduce our, our first panel. We have Assistant Secretary of Defense for Energy Installations and Environment, Brendan Owens. Representing the Navy, we have Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Fleet Readiness and Logistics, Vice Admiral Rick, Ricky Williamson. And as Senator Bozeman said, um, I will note that this is the Vice Admiral's last hearing with us as he is retiring from the Navy after 43 years. Thank you for your service. We all appreciate it. And finally, we have the Deputy Commander for Installations and Logistics for the Marine Corps, Lieutenant General Edward Banta. Uh, we will proceed now with witness testimony, starting with Assistant Secretary Owens, then Admiral uh, Williamson, and finishing with General Banta. Each have three minutes, and Assistant Secretary Owens, you may begin. Thanks very much, Chairwoman Murray. Ranking Member Bozeman, distinguished members of the subcommittee, on behalf of myself and my service colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the President's fiscal year 2024 budget request for the department's military construction and family housing programs. This is my first time testifying before this committee. Got uh, some friends at the table who have got me beat by quite a, quite a bit. Uh, and I look forward to working with you in the coming months to continue aligning our policies and resources to support the, the national defense strategy. The 2022 NDS is clear. We're operating in an increasingly complex global threat environment and, environment, and environmental change. Uh, characterized by significant geopolitical, technical, economic, and environmental change. The People's Republic of China remains the dominant pacing challenge with its increasingly aggressive efforts to undermine U.S. alliances and security partnerships in the Indo-Pacific region. We also face threats like, from actors like Russia, North Korea, and Iran, as well as climate change and other transboundary challenges. Together, these threats not only pressure the Joint Forces' power projection and maneuver capabilities, but also put the safety and security of the homeland at risk. Countering these threats requires a resilient joint force and defense ecosystem that can operate in a contested environment at home and abroad. As such, we are ensuring that our installations and infrastructure are resilient to a wide range of challenges by implementing policy updates, innovating in how we plan, design, and build, and, employing and, employing and deploying technology to counter the diversifying threats we face. In the Indo-Pacific specifically, there are two key priorities that will be critical to the success of this effort retaining vital mission capabilities in the state of Hawaii and ensuring that critical military construction efforts in Guam and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands remain on track by extending the exemption for the H-2B visa temporary need requirement through 2029. We look forward to partnering with Congress, the state of Hawaii, Guam, the CNMI, and other federal stakeholders in doing the work necessary to ensure that these priorities can be addressed. More broadly, we are requesting $14.7 billion in the budget for military construction across the department, an increase of 44% from last year's requests. In addition, we are requesting $3.5 billion for installation energy, uh, which will support our efforts to ensure we have credible, resilient installation energy capabilities that can deter, defend against, and help defeat adversarial actions. The backbone of these efforts is the Energy Resilience and Conservation Investment Program, or ERSIP, which supports a full range of projects and technologies with a focus on microgrids, backup generation, and energy storage. Our request for this vital program is $634 million, $81 million above our FY 2023 request. Finally, the department continues to focus on ensuring that service members have access to safe, quality, affordable, family, and unaccompanied housing. We are requesting $1.9 billion for family housing to sustain our increased focus and in ensuring the delivery and maintenance of quality housing for military families and an additional $463 million to modernize unaccompanied personnel housing to improve privacy and provide greater amenities. For privatized housing, we will also continue to ensure accountability at all levels within DOD and the, and the MHPI companies as necessary to enforce performance. Nothing is more important to us than our people our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, guardians, and their families, the investments that we make to improve the built and natural environments where they live and work are investments that pay off by improving their health and well-being. We appreciate Congress's and this subcommittee's continued support for these efforts, and we look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Admiral Williamson. Chairwoman Murray, Ranking Member Bozeman, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it is an honor to appear before you on behalf of our sailors and their families. 
Thank you for your continued support to the Navy, its military construction program, and our 70 installations worldwide, which enable us to strengthen readiness, support delivery of new platforms, and ensure quality of service for our sailors. The Chief of Naval Operations issued a call to action last year for Navy leaders to apply a set of Navy-proven leadership problem-solving best practices that empower our people to achieve exceptional performance. My, my organization has fully embraced this call to continuously self-assess and benchmark to get real to see ourselves, followed by self-correction and staying left of problems. To meet the challenges of strategic competition in an evolving threat environment, we must enable global logistics with resilient shore infrastructure and be honest about our current performance. Maintaining our advantage at sea requires transformational change ashore to support and sustain the fleet of the future. To achieve this, my organization continues to implement the Naval Global Strategy Ashore, our strategic direction for the Navy shore enterprise in alignment with the National Defense Strategy, the Tri-Service Maritime Strategy, and the CNO's Navigation Plan. As a surface warfare officer, I can confirm that all readiness starts from the shore. Navy installations are essential shore platforms from which naval forces train, deploy, and maintain forward presence. To get real, over the past two decades, the Navy has taken risk and shore investments to focus on a float readiness and strengthen future platform and weapon systems capabilities. Our investments in FY23 and proposed budget for FY24 begins reversing the impacts of those risks. Our single most strategic asset are our sailors who deserve world-class quality of service, a combination of both quality of life and quality of work. PB24 improves quality of life for our sailors through investments in unaccompanied housing, PPV, and child development centers. In FY23, we invested $140 million in unaccompanied housing, and our FY24 budget invests $165 million. Investments in child care are directed at decreasing wait lists and being competitive with the private sector. The wait list is currently at 5,500, down from 8,000 in FY22. Our goal is to further decrease it to 2,000 by the end of 24. To address quality of work, PB24 funds sustainment at 100% for nuclear deterrence requirements and 87% for remaining DOD modeled requirements. PB24 also invests in demolition funds to reduce the Navy's footprint and support better base design. For our military construction program, we thank you for the addition of $671 million to our FY3 budget, which funded six additional projects. The Navy's 4.7 billion PB24 military uh, construction request funds planning and design unspecified minor construction in 19 projects, including four Pacific deterrent initiative efforts in Guam. The shipyard infrastructure optimization program is critical to preparing the nation's four public shipyards to meet the future needs of the Navy's nuclear powered submarine and aircraft carrier force in support of the national defense strategy. We are making great pro progress in FY23 with the awarding of contracts for area development plans for Norfolk and Portsmouth Naval Shipyards, Phase 2 of industrial modeling for all of four of our shipyards, and an additional project planning efforts. Our FY24 SI budget provides $2.4 billion to continue to advance the program. With Congress' continued support, SIOP investments will halt the degradation of our aging shipyard infrastructure deliver required dry dock repairs and upgrades, and recapitalize industrial equipment with modern technology, substantially increasing productivity and safety. Thank you for the opportunity to test, testify before you. It has been my distinct honor and pleasure to work with you over the past four years to meet shared goals for our Navy and our country. We look forward to future collaboration and the pursuit to warfighting capability and support for our sailors and their families. Thank you. Thank you very much. General Banta. Chairwoman Murray, Ranking Member Bozeman, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Marine Corps' FY24 military construction budget request. First, I'd like to thank you for funding last year's budget request and the unfunded priority list. Congress's support will accelerate improvements to quality of life, enable Marine Corps force design capabilities, and rapidly grow our Indo-PACOM posture. In FY24, we are requesting $1.3 billion for 16 military construction projects, as well as planning and design funds. This request aims to modernize our installations and reflects a balanced investment approach to support required warfighting capabilities, improve quality of life for our Marines and their families, and increase the resiliency of our installations. 
Viewed through an operational lens, these investments ultimately improve the readiness and the lethality of our force. Eight of our 16 projects will help bolster our presence in the Indo-Pacific region. Seven of them are in Guam, including four projects that will posture combat and logistics capabilities on the island, and one project that will enable our marine rotational force in Darwin, Australia. The remaining eight projects in our request are in the continental U.S., yet complement our Pacific investments, recognizing that our ability to campaign forward begins here at home. For example, our budget includes four projects that support aviation and ground combat capabilities to include aviation command and maintenance facilities in North Carolina and a radar support facility in Dam Neck, Virginia. Constructing new communications towers on our ranges in 29 Palms, California improves safety and supports our advanced live virtual constructive training, while a cybersecurity operations facility in Maryland supports critical operations in the cyber domain. We also appreciate this committee's continued support to improving quality of life for our Marines and their families. To that end, we plan to invest $318 million, or 23% of our MILCON budget, against four quality of life projects to include a child development center, a recreation center, and a religious ministry services center on Guam. Most of our family housing construction request is also focused on Guam to build 57 additional units there. Recognizing the importance of housing our single Marines, we're requesting one new barracks at Marine Barracks Washington and to renovate and intend to renovate 13 more across the force. We're also prepared to renovate 12 more barracks if additional restoration and modernization funds are available. We will continue to work with you to deliver the best we can for our most valuable weapon system, the individual Marine. We're focused on improving the resiliency of our bases and stations so they can prepare for, respond to, and recover from all types of hazards and threats. Our investments in strong community partnerships, water treatment infrastructure like the project on Marine Corps Base Quantico, and electric utility upgrades will improve our resiliency, enable force generation, and support warfighting requirements. Again, with an eye towards increased readiness and lethality. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today and for your continued oversight, input, and support. I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you very much to all of you. And we will now begin a round of five-minute uh, five questions for our first panel. And I ask, ask my colleagues, if you can, to please keep track of your clock and stay within those five minutes. Assistant Secretary Owens, let me start with you. I want to ask you about the quality of life for military families across our country. As you know, military families really struggle to access uh, access affordable, high-quality child care. And it's, I know it's a very complex issue, but one clear reason is the lack of available or appropriate physical space on our installations. Um, quality of life also touches on things like family housing, on-base dining facilities, schools, which are critical to supporting our service members and their families. And investing in these quality of life services and support I know improves recruitment and retention of our service members and contributes directly to overall to military re readiness. I am generally uh, encouraged that the department has done a better job in programming for these projects rather than waiting for Congress to act. However, backlog re backlogs remain across the board. I wanted to ask you, how does the president's budget request address the most critical quality of life needs? Thank you for the question, Senator, and I totally agree with you. I'm also encouraged that the military departments have prioritized investment in, in facilities that, that will improve quality of life for our service members and their families. Uh, there, uh, our, our budget is requesting $1.9 billion for family housing um, and an additional $463 million to modernize unaccompanied personal housing, personnel housing. And I think that that's a, a, a pretty good start. The, the ability for us to uh, make sure that we are never satisfied with the level of service that we are able to provide to our service members and their families uh, is something that I think is uh, imperative. We need to adopt a footing where we need to be in a continuous improvement mode and, and move out from there uh, because I think that you are directly connecting it to critical issues like recruitment and retention, and we need to make sure that we are very focused on delivering high-quality uh, places to live and work. What are, you, what are the biggest challenges with quality of life issues? I, I, I would say the biggest challenges are the, the diversity of the types of facilities that we need to develop and maintain. You know, a child care facility is not a family, it's not a, fa it's not a house, right? And a, and, a, and a barracks is not a, a, 
a mess. So that challenge uh, to be able to standardize across all of our military departments is something that I think the DOD, OSD, can do a better job of working with the military departments to make sure that we are setting and maintaining a high bar across the board uh, so that we don't have situations where on joint basis, for example, uh, you know, a Navy person doesn't want to live in an Air Force house or vice versa, those types of things. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. Admiral Williamson, um, I am closely following the Shipyard Infrastructure Optimization Plan, as you can imagine, and I am eager to see the program stay on budget and on schedule, particularly as it affects um, Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. I understand the PSYOP will um, and should evolve and improve, but we have to make sure its core goals remain on track. Can you talk about how the Navy is working on projects and resourcing the program to get this done in a way that effectively prepares the facility and workforce for both the short-term and the long-term needs? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, I think this year we've made tremendous progress with PSYOP. Um, our budget... Uh, I think directly reflects uh, our commitment to PSYOP and that investment. Uh, a couple things that you mentioned. One, uh, my leadership challenged us. As you know, this is uh, um, a very high priority in supporting our uh, nuke deterrence uh, in support of national defense. And so uh, the challenge has been, what have we learned? And so to your point about uh, staying on track with cost, schedule, and scope, all three of those things are very important. And uh, when we first uh, did this, we... Uh, we chose not to do it like we typically do projects. We, we use a major acquisition process, a lot of learning to be had. One of the things uh, for a price, to understand what the market, uh, raw material costs, the cost of the workforce to be able to do this, to plan that into the project early enough to, to allow the contractor that's doing the work to stay on schedule. That is very critical to the maintenance of our uh, submarines and ships. I think that that's reflected in our investments. Uh, the other thing that uh, you talked about, ma'am, is to look at the shipyard as a whole. Uh, it does no good to um, paint the floor and then paint the ceiling. So the utilities, for example, that support our infrastructure uh, have to be invested in. And so uh, we have made, and the budget reflects this, we have made the decision to go ahead and start strengthening the backbone of our shipyards to ensure that it's uh, resilient, agile, and also efficient. Those are uh, measures that we're taking. Identifying the critical path, marrying the work uh, supply chain to the workforce, to the workflow, to the production efforts are very critical. And we're uh, seeing that reflected in the ADPs. We have completed Hawaii's. We're doing the analysis now on Hawaii's ADP, and we'll apply the learning there at Puget, at Portsmouth, and Norfolk. And we think there's tremendous opportunity to accelerate uh, the uh, de design and development of the projects as we move forward. Uh, but we are very uh, grateful to the committee for the support and uh, allowing us to move at pace with that, ma'am. Very good. I'm out of time. I do want to act, ask you about PFAS. I know that 40 of our um, uh, investigations are going ongoing right now. So, um, General, I may come back to you after. We, if nobody else ma asks my question, I will come back to you on that because that's critical for all of us. Senator Bozeman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd like to, to ask a question that has come up repeatedly as I visit with, you know, different entities throughout the service. This year's request includes $2 billion in support of PDI projects. As projects in the Indo-Pacific region continue to increase across the department, they may end up competing against one another for limited resources. In fact, I think they are. Um, I'd like to hear from, from all of you on what you see as the biggest constraints for MILCON execution in the region. Is there any coordination between the services or OSD on program execution to ensure that projects can successfully execute in a crowded environment? I, I know this is a huge problem, and uh, I think I can speak for the committee in saying we want to help you, uh, but we need to understand exactly what the problem is. So, Mr. Owens? Thank you for uh, providing the opportunity to, to, to continue to talk about H-2B visas in, in Guam. I think, Senator, the in my career, I, I thought I had been involved in very large construction projects. Uh, I got into this job, and I looked at the scope and the scale and the schedule of what is planned for Guam, and I realized that I haven't been yet. Uh, the, the The challenges that I see in terms of 
looking at $2 billion of infrastructure invested across Indopaycom are acute in, in Guam. Uh, there is a there is a limited existing construction capacity that is, as far as we understand it, uh, currently uh, already doing everything. They're fully employed and doing all the and doing all the work that's currently ongoing, uh, and we have a lot more in the pipelines. There's a bow wave coming that we need to be ready for. Uh, in terms of, and I think that the H2B visa extension to 2029 is critical in that. In terms of coordination, uh, we are in the final stages of standing up a senior leader installation council, which is myself and the energy installation and environment assist assistant secretaries from all the military departments. And the goal of that is to look at acute situations well, it's dif dif difficult to characterize Guam as an acute situation, but specific situations like Guam and what's going on in Hawaii to be able to coordinate across the military department so that we can, that we're not overstressing the infrastructure for dealing with things like NEPA or environmental permitting and those types of things. Um, but the construction capacity issues uh, are, are things that are, are outside our control at this point. Very good. Admiral? Yes, sir. Um, the visas, to reiterate, reiterate what Secretary Owens talked about, I think is a huge step. Again, kind of taking it back to um, the, the previous conversation, um, you know, understanding the critical path of the work that's needed to be done in Guam and making sure that we're working with the industry partners uh, to get as much information as we can to ensure that we understand the critical path to success. Uh, one of the things that we've a lesson learned we pulled out a uh, PSYOP, and I'm trying to apply across all the United States Navy. Understand the demands of the workforce, understanding the raw materials and access to that, making sure that the resources are available to the contractor to buy down risk and buy those ahead of schedule, I think help us keep keep us on, the, uh, on that track. But uh, as we look at Guam in particular, to your question, it's not just the Navy and the Marine Corps, it's also the Army, the Air Force, uh, Space Force, you know, a lot of folks on Guam. The last thing I think we want to do is comp compete with each other. So we need to be able to understand what the requirement is, what that critical path is, and uh, execute that plan. That's good. Thank you. General. Sir, thanks very much for the opportunity to, uh, to, to answer your question. So to follow up on Secretary Owens, um, the scope and scale of our construction effort on Guam is uh, pretty substantial. Uh, a total of... Um, 132 projects, we're only about 15% complete, so the vast majority of that construction effort is still in front of us, which reinforces the importance of that H-2B visa to ensure that we're able to keep these on schedule, cost, and, uh, and within scope. Um, I would also say in terms of joint land use to kind of follow on from what uh, from what Ricky was talking about. Uh, we recognize that it's not just the Marine Corps, it's not just the, the other services, but there are other agencies coming to Guam as well. So there is a joint land use study ongoing right now. We expect that to be complete next year and fully expect that there will be some shortfalls in uh, requirements, particularly quality of life and support, uh, family housing being one, uh, Dodea schools, likely additional commissary uh, capacity requirements. And those, I think, will help us further um, identify and deconflict requirements going forward. So we'd certainly appreciate uh, help when we, when we come back with any requests in the future. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator Baldwin. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you to our witnesses uh, today. Uh, I, uh, Mr. Owens, um, in, in previous years, there was a discrepancy between access to funding and authorities um, uh, relating to hazardous substance uh, uh, remediation efforts between the active component and the National Guard uh, installations. Due to a policy change um, in 2017, the National Guard was removed from the defense environmental restoration program and no longer had the same access to funds or authorities as the rest of the DOD. Um, my colleagues and I secured uh, a reversal of that policy uh, to place the National Guard in installations back into the program just last year. Um, so Mr. Owens, can you um, please first confirm that the National Guard installations currently have access to cleanup funds through the Defense Environmental Restoration Program. And I have some follow-ups, so let's start there. 
Senator Baldwin, I'm going to have to take this for the record. I, I can't okay. confirm it. I'm not read in on, not, not up to speed on that particular issue at the moment. Okay. So, um, so I will ask uh, you then a couple of questions to follow up with uh, because I had uh, I, I have a, a several on this regard. So there's that gap in time where the uh, National Guard facilities uh, were not part of the Defense Environmental uh, Restoration Program. Um, I want to also get information of how we look back and um, and have some parity or equity uh, uh, for that time uh, that the guard installations uh, were excluded from the program. And um, uh, I would also like to get some information on how you prioritize um, sites for cleanup of, of hazardous substances, including PFAS, uh, uh, moving forward. And, um, I, and, and certainly want to uh, have your commitment that we ensure parity in access to funds for National Guard installations moving forward. So that's the series on, on this question. And I appreciate that. I, I would say that the, the, the landscape is changing uh, significantly with the release of the EPA's proposed regulatory rule around PFAS, and that is going to have significant impacts on our Defense Environment Restoration Program. So as we look at the the way ahead for for derp and specifically as it relates to to our our remediation responsibilities and drinking water responsibilities for PFAS, uh, we're going to be having to ask very difficult questions about prioritization. Um, but but I will commit to get back to you on all the things that yeah. you're interested in, in learning more but about. I, I I appreciate that and the, the difficulty in in making those priority decisions. I just would keep in mind for a state like Wisconsin, where many of our facilities are guard facilities, that we were not able to participate uh, uh, between 2017 and uh, that reversal of policy last year or this year. It, it goes into effect this year for um, uh, the 2023 NDAA. Um, so uh, another uh, uh, question for you, Mr. Owens. Um, the Office of Local Defense Community Cooperation uh, provides critical assistance to counties and municipalities to both foster cooperation with military installations as well as to address any concerns or challenges communities encounter as neighbors to military installations. This office has provided critical assistance to Wisconsin in the form of a planning and outreach grant as the state prepares to receive this month um, F-35 uh, aircraft at the Truax Airfield in Madison, Wisconsin. I've um, noticed a trend over the last few years in which uh, the budget request for uh, OLDCC falls well below what many deem necessary to accomplish the increasing program demands. So can you please describe what you're doing to support OLDCC uh, as it expands um, in both staffing levels and in demand for the programs. Uh, thank you for highlighting the the incredible interconnectedness of installations and defense communities. I think it is a critical. Uh, it is a crit We we can't have mission completion without without defense communities. That that much is clear. Uh, I meet regularly with the OLDCC team, um, and, and the director and I have been uh, talking about ways to leverage some of the authorities that they have uh, to, and make sure that they are resourced to be able to do the work outside the fence line that makes the work inside the fence line possible. Uh, so this is uh, something that I uh, am, am, am focused on uh, and appreciate the, the opportunity to, to talk more about going forward, and I, I hope that we can uh, address the concern that you have about funding going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, after the Cold War, we divested significant capacity in the Indo-Pacific and adopted a posture that assumed a more concentrated basing model. It was assumed that that would suffice. Ultimately, we traded away the flexibility of having larger network of bases and facilities, ports and dry docks and runways for cost savings and efficiencies. So of needing to rapidly reconstitute in order to support distributed operations. Uh, Mr. Secretary, how would you um, 
look at the investments that are proposed by this budget request to uh, support or improve our posture in the Indo-Pacific. You mentioned some things in Guam, but there's a, a number of areas. Um, many of our allies, Australia, Japan, um, we're looking at U.S. territories in the region as well uh, where investments need to be um, made. So how, how would you characterize that? Thanks for the question, Senator Fisher, and I would uh, ask my, my colleagues to weigh in here. Uh, the, the $2 billion for, the, for PDI uh, is, is the start, right? So we're looking across the Indo-Pacific to, to basically understand what that looks like. I think the defense of Guam is another piece of this puzzle uh, that we're going through, but, but the diversification and the ability to project force into Indo-PACOM is uh, a pivot that we are actively uh, making and uh, Maybe if I can turn it over to Admiral Williams. Yeah, Admiral, if you could tell me, you know, specifically some of the investments that are proposed there. And I know in the Navy's budget request for MILCON uh, support, uh, I'm specifically interested in deterrence in the region. Yes, ma'am. Uh, specifically to Guam, uh, we have four projects next year, about $750 million. Um, two communication uh, stations, very vital. Uh, one's actually being built on the Air Force side of the base. A uh, satellite communication station and then a missile uh, integration test facility. That gets to Guam. Your broader question about distributed maritime ops and expeditionary events basing. Uh, I am not a logistician by trade. And so I'm a service warfare officer. So everybody said go back and read what the greatest generation did. and. Uh, Ma'am, you nailed it. It's about being distributed across a very large AOR, 6,000 by 4,000. It's not just the infrastructure and the bases and places, as Admiral Aquilino calls it, but it's also what's afloat. And so the totality of our investment is not just within the infrastructure. It's also with ships and other means to be able to sustain that force. And so uh, I think our budget reflects that. I would be happy to come back and talk to you because I think we get to a very classified level once we talk about the investments. But I do believe that our budget uh, reflects uh, support of Admiral Aquilino, Indo-PACOM, and PAC Fleet in their uh, laydown plan, ma'am. Well, and the, th the threats that we face in that region as well, um, when you look at lack of flexibility and when you look at concentration, uh, those are immense for the future, the threats. Yes, ma'am. And uh, again, not being a logistician, but understanding uh, what we call the kill chain, all the way from the industrial base to the last tactical mile. That has got to be resilient. It has to be agile. We've got to be able to move things about quickly in support of the fleet and uh, airmen and soldiers as well. And so um, I'd be more than happy, ma'am, to come back over and talk to you in detail and, and with that plan. But your basic answer would be that, that you think this budget is addressing that. I think, yes, ma'am. I think we're beginning to get after that. There, obviously, there's some constraints with, uh, you mentioned allies and partners getting access. We have to work through that. We're, again, working very closely with Indo-PACOM and PAC Fleet to gain that. I meet on a regular basis with Japanese and Australian counterparts to understand their capabilities and what they can bring. Uh, and so, uh, yes, ma'am, I do think that this budget begins to reflect that we're getting after that. Thank you. Uh, General, with the Marine Corps, um, can you tell me how you feel about uh, the budgets that's presented there with regards to deterrence in the region? Yes, ma'am. Thanks very much. So as I mentioned, this budget uh, of our 16 projects, eight of them are in the Indo-Pacific, seven on Guam specifically, which directly supports our bilateral agreement with the government of Japan to relocate forces off of Okinawa and the first island chain onto Guam. So significant investment in Guam. That relocation starts at the end of 2024. I would also reference the investment that we're making on a, um, uh, an airfield ramp in Darwin, Australia. Uh, in support of our rotational force that goes down there. And then in terms of the logistics footprint, recognizing that we need to be in a more distributed lay down, uh, we are investing in what we call our global positioning network, which is a series of afloat and ashore locations to pre-position capability forward. And again, if you're interested, I could come back and talk to you in a more classified okay, setting. Thank, thank you. Thank you. I, I was in Darwin a few years ago to look at the facilities that uh, were waiting for our troops to go there. So I, I thank you for the... Uh, information about what uh, has continued to be improvements in that area. Thank yes, you. Senator Peters. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Welcome, gentlemen. Uh, thank you for being here today. I appreciate uh, the conversation. I have um, just a couple questions, uh, very local uh, in nature uh, in, in Michigan. So my first question is for you, uh, uh, General Banta. The, uh, the fiscal year 24 budget request includes $24 million investment for uh, supply facilities for the Marine Reserve Unit in uh, Battle Creek, uh, Michigan, at the Air National Guard base there. I would just like you to, to speak, if you would, to how important investments like that Marine Reserve Facility in Battle Creek uh, is to the Marine Corps and how they're so critical for Marine readiness and why these investments must be made. Yes, Senator, thanks very much for the question. So the Marine Corps Reserve is an absolutely critical element of our total force. So the readiness of the, rear, of the reserve component directly contributes to the readiness of the larger Marine Corps. Uh, at Battle Creek in particular, it's home to uh, a couple of different Marine Corps Reserve units that includes a logistics company from uh, Engineer 6th uh, Engineer Support Battalion, and then Alpha Company 1st Battalion 24th Marines, which is a, uh, an infantry company. So in addition to just providing uh, storage and and headquarters space. This is also supports training and readiness. So it, these units have activated several times and deployed several times over the years uh, in support of, of global operations. So investments there, investments at home directly influence and support the readiness of our reserve component and the total force. Um, so we will continue to invest where we can in our reserve facilities, and I think that that that. That spot in Battle Creek is representative of others across the nation as well. Uh, I pr appreciate that, General. <clears throat> and uh, so I want to talk about another Marine Reserve uh, facility in Michigan. This is uh, one that uh, is at Selfridge Air National Guard Base. Uh, there was a proposal to consolidate, to, to move uh, that uh, facility and to upgrade uh, that facility, which is uh, long overdue. But my understanding, uh, the project was abruptly canceled, and there's been no timeline provided as to what may uh, happen in the future. Uh, I understand there were some potential cost overruns associated with uh, supply chain disruptions as a result of the pandemic, but uh, those have been working they, their way through. Uh, hopefully we are in a better situation right now. But I, but I would certainly appreciate uh, you working with my office uh, to find out how we can uh, get this project back on track and have some sort of timeline. I don't know how aware you are of that, but if you are, certainly would appreciate your help. Yes, sir. Thanks very much. So you're, you're correct that that project um, was canceled due to a significant increase in cost. As we look to, to regenerate it, we want to make sure that we have the requirements correct up front. Uh, as part of our larger force design uh, initiative, sort of uh, re, uh, reforming the Marine Corps, certain aspects of it for great power competition, we're looking at what our infantry battalions uh, would, would require in the reserve component. Uh, in order to ensure that we get the facilities uh, design aspects of it correct. So I'd be happy to come back when we have further refined those requirements and give you a better idea of what the timeline looks like for that project. I hope that helps, sir. That is, and I appreciate appreciate you coming back. Thank you so yes, much uh, for, for that. It is a, an, uh, I think it's an important project and uh, helps uh, strengthen that Marine Corps presence on Selfridge Air National Guard base as well. Appreciate yes, that. Assistant Secretary Owens, uh, I was pleased to see that this budget um, uh, can make significant investments in our uh, Army science and technology enterprise, and particularly pleased uh, with investments in the Ground Vehicle System Center at the Detroit uh, Arsenal. Uh, however, I'd like you to speak, if you would, sir, uh, on how robust investments, not, not just in the R&D facilities themselves, but in the quality of life and resiliency infrastructure, like child development centers, which have been discussed already, as well as flooding uh, mitigation improvements, other kinds of improvements that are necessary in, uh, in that Detroit facility, uh, how those modernization uh, efforts uh, should also be prioritized to support uh, R&D generally. Uh, thanks for the question, Senator, and I, and I agree with you. I think that the, the, the ability for us to make sure that our R&D facilities are, are funded and, and resilient is uh, a critical aspect of this. I, I would point to some of the investments that we're making in ERSIP, on the Energy Resilience and Conservation Investment Program. We've requested $634 million, uh, which is about $81 million more than our 2023 request. Uh, and I think the goal there is to make sure that we are creating the conditions around which uh, continuity of operations can be maintained. Uh, but beyond that, I would say that the uh, investments that we're making to uh, quality of life uh, are, are again, uh, critically important to all of the recruitment and retention challenges that, that all the military departments uh, are, are, are struggling with right now. Great. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Schatz. Thank you, Chair, Vice Chair, and uh, uh, panelists. Uh, appreciate you being here. Uh, first, I want to talk about resilience for future MILCON projects. We have to consider factors today that were not part of the decision making decades ago. Severe weather events are more frequent and more severe, and we can't just update building codes or do a required basic risk management assessment to check a box. This actually has to be an analysis because we're going to waste a lot of money if we're not aware of the new risks. So for Assistant Secretary Owens, how does OSD ensure that the services incorporate resilience metrics at all levels from the base commander to the secretary of the service? Thank you for the question. I, I couldn't agree more with, with, the, with the statement about how resilience is critical. I, I would start with uh, pointing to the Defense Climate Assessment tool, uh, which, is a, which is a robust tool that allows us to be able to contextualize and understand where we faced risk associated with changing, uh, changing weather patterns and climate. Uh, whether that is rising sea levels, whether it's increased frequency of storms, or, or, or whether it's wildfire, uh, DCAT gives us the ability to create an understanding and project in various scenarios high, medium, and low warming. Is everybody complying? Is everybody doing that? Because one of the things I'm hearing, it's just chatter. I want to understand on the record whether this is happening or not. I understand that. The theory goes some of the people who manage bases and installations that would score very poorly on this are going very slowly in the process. Um, and that's kind of understandable because why you, would you hurry uh, up a data set that is going to undermine your ability to recapitalize? Is there, is there any truth to that? I, I think it, the specific to the example that you just gave, uh, I'll look into that and get back to you, Senator. But I would say that the conversations that we've had over the past week um, lead me to believe that, that the services, the military departments are using DCAT information to inform their decision making, whether or not that is that requires DOD to issue a policy that makes it a requirement that they do it. Um, it it's happening. So we're trying to balance the, the stick versus the, the, the carrot that, that each of these military departments is uh, uh, challenged with. And whether if, if a DOD instruction or if a DOD directive is needed in order to make that a make make sure that we are keeping uh, the availability and the, and the applicability of DCAT, um, something that the military departments are accountable to, we will we will move in that direction. Well, uh, I don't want to get into specific basing decisions or the recapitalization uh, capitalization of, of basing, but I do think we're going to be in a scenario like some of these small towns who, who, who are being rebuilt two and three and four times paid for by the federal government, and we just can't afford to do that. And so whatever our politics are around climate and whatever you want to attribute the cause of increasing severe weather events uh, to – um, we can't afford to allow politics to interfere with our basing decisions, and I am quite worried um, that we're going to keep rebuilding these places because there's a political economy around ignoring the facts of the matter. Uh, my final question as I uh, run out of time, Dry Dock 3 at Pearl Harbor Naval, Naval Shipyard can't support newer submarines, so I was happy to see the Navy budget include MILCON funds to replace it with Dry Dock 5, but I was surprised that the Navy added the project to the unfunded priorities list. Uh, Vice Admiral Williamson, when will the Navy inform Congress about what additional resources are necessary? And the other question is, why wasn't this in the original request? Yes, sir. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, the, the request is to ask for flexibility and to be able to move money forward, to buy down risk. And so uh, what we've learned out of the other PSYOP projects is to work very closely with ind industry partners. The buy-down risk part of it is to allow the monies uh, more uh, earlier within the project uh, to allow the uh, contractor to invest in raw materials, as you know, which are running very high because of inflation right now. Also to start making the investments in the workforce to be able to stay on cost, schedule, and scope. So the requirement, sir, is just to bring money uh, to the left to allow us to get ahead in uh, an execution. So speaking of the workforce, as you know, a project of this size requires a PLA. Where are we on the beginning of negotiations? Uh, yes, sir. I think those are underway. I can uh, get back to you with the details on it, but I know it's, I'm know i pretty sure it's underway. Yes. Okay, that's not, I mean, I, I'm not trying to contradict you, uh, uh, but, but that is not what I'm hearing. Okay, so sir. if it's underway, 
then the head of the carpenters union, for instance, doesn't know it. Okay, uh, sir. So let, let's make sure that everyone's in communication Roger that, and the sir. PLA negotiations uh, begin. Yes, sir. Thank you. Senator Haggerty. Senator Haggerty. Thank you, Chair Murray and Ranking Member Bozeman for holding the hearing. Welcome to everybody. General Banna, can I start with you today? Uh, it's good to see you here. As we all know, the Marine Corps is pursuing the Force Design 2030 plan to fundamentally reorganize itself to deal with the military threats of the 21st century. The implementation of Force Design 2030 will involve moving Marines from Japan to Guam. And I'm interested in the many ways that this affects our ally in Japan and our U.S. territory in Guam. And so I just wanted to ask you, General Banta, if you could briefly summarize the types of military construction in Guam that lies ahead so that we can facilitate this movement of forces from Japan. Senator, thank you very much for the question. Um, you're absolutely right. The military construction on Guam is significant. Uh, it underpins the bilateral agreement with the government of Japan, which facilitates the movement of Marines from Okinawa to Guam. Um, in January, we reactivated Marine Corps Base Camp Bala. It's the first base on, the, on Guam that we have built in over 70 years. It is literally coming from the ground up, almost brand new. So to answer your specific question, uh, we, are, we have a, a variety of military construction requirements mm -hmm. there from operational unit facilities, logistics and combat units, quality of life, family housing, um, training facilities, uh, ranges. So all of those are being phased to ensure that when we start this movement by the end of 2024, that we ha have appropriate facilities there and ready for, for units to move into. Just to make sure, General, I, yes, I, I want to see and make, make certain you feel that the Defense Department, including, including the Naval Facilities uh, Engineering Command, is prioritizing the type of military construction in Guam that is required. Are you, get, are you getting that sort of synchronization that you would hope to see in yes, order to make this all Yes, happen? sir, absolutely. That's, that's good to hear. As the Marines undertake the relocation from Japan to Guam, uh, do you see potential issues that could hamper the relocation? Are there issues that you'd like to highlight for us that we should be aware of? Yes, sir. Uh, I, I think it's been brought up once or twice already, but the, the, the size of the workforce, the construction workforce available on Guam is insufficient. Yeah. So um, extending the H-2B visa um, uh, uh, issue would be very helpful to us to avoid significant cost and schedule increases that could potentially delay the, the, that movement from Okinawa to Guam. Have you seen a backlog or have you seen it actually slow down as the pandemic caused a impact on that? We haven't really seen a backlog per se, but we're starting to see bid bus on certain projects. And if we don't get that waiver relief, we would anticipate significant cost increases, potentially on the order of $1.1 to $1.5 billion. Okay. Got it. Significant. Thank you, General Banta. Uh, Vice Admiral Williamson, I'd like to turn to you. Um, I'm pleased to see that your N4 logistics staff uh, has reached out to my Senate staff to demonstrate demonstrate the Navy's navigation plan implementation framework for solving problems like contested logistics or how we resupply. I'm also pleased to see that the NIF framework's collaborative approach is beginning to break through stovepipes and how we shoot, how we maneuver, how we defend, and how we resupply in hostile environments. Um, my question, Admiral Williamson, is what are ways that this committee can support the military construction necessary to better enable your ability to sustain the fleet for a potential conflict and conflict in indo pacom area of responsibility yes sir thank you very much uh for the question um and thank you very much for um uh, your continued support uh i i would uh, fall in line with uh ted's um answer uh as we look at uh you know the distributed operations mm -hmm. across that front it's not going to be just Guam. It's going to be in other places as well. So having the uh, the workforce available, uh, making sure that we understand the critical path and lay that out, and we communicate that those MILCON projects, and in some cases it's just not MILCON. It's also RM projects. We tend to talk large projects. Yeah. There's a lot of small projects as well. And so being able to communicate the, that total requirement to you uh, and uh, early and being able to uh, mentioned things like the workforce. One of the other things that uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, I think it's still left over from the pandemic is um, cost of raw materials, for example. Uh, we're in high, uh, uh, high cost areas. And yeah. so if I take just the standard rate of inflation and apply that to a project, I'm going to miss. And that's I can a, see. I that's can a see missed it. opportunity that you mentioned. Very quickly, um, we've got some, I, I think, great new 
opportunities evolving in terms of access with the Philippines, with Japan's desire to do more. And I'd, I'd like to ask you if there are specific military construction projects that we need to be prioritizing so that the United States is in the best, best position it can be to leverage this new access that we're obtaining. Yes, sir. Um, I would love uh, to come back to you uh, with a more detailed answer on that uh, question, if that's possible. Yeah, I'd, uh, so I take I'd love to hear it. Come back. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And let me come back to you on PFAS, since nobody went in depth on that, both to General Banta and to Admiral Williamson. And I do know that the Navy is conducting PFAS investigations at 40 of our closed and realigned installations, and they've completed the initial phase for roughly half of those. There's a lot of work to be done. Uh, a lot of those installations are in my home state of Washington, and their surrounding communities have some of the worst recorded contamination levels. So let me ask both, both of you, with regards to closed and realigned installations, what additional resources do you need to help clean up environmental contaminants, like uh, including PFAS? And uh, General, I'll start with you and then go to... Um, Chairwoman, thanks very much for the question. So, uh, yes, we take... Um, Providing a clean, safe, healthy environment for our Marines and families is extremely serious, say, and PFOS, PFOA are, are a significant challenge to that, not just within the military, but DOD-wide. Um, we currently have uh, 12 active and two reserve sites that have suspected past AFFF uh, storage or use on them and have been assessing them for potential cleanup. We've completed four of those site investigations with the remainder scheduled to be complete by the end of this year. In terms of additional resources, I'm, I'm honestly not aware of any right now. Uh, if I could come back to you with any future requests, okay. I'd be happy to do very so. Very much appreciate that, yes, Admiral. Ma yes, ma'am. Um, also, very committed to providing, uh, you know, uh, safe water for not only our active bases, but any of the bases we've been uh, uh, to in the past. Uh, currently 149, both active and BRAC bases, uh, 16 of those locations uh, we're actively working. Uh, as far as needed funds, uh, in uh, PB24, we've got $160 million laid in uh, to look at the cleanup, uh, provide uh, safe drinking water in, in locations that uh, uh, may not be there. Uh, but uh, ma'am, uh, I've would love to get back to you with uh, additional detail of uh, anything else additionally we need. Okay, the committee will need that, so I appreciate it from both of you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Senator Murkowski? Madam Chairman, I'm going to um, defer to the fact that we have a second panel coming. I will be submitting a question uh, for the record uh, to you, Secretary Owens. This relates to the final EIS um, at Fort Wainwright for the power plant there and the uh, the call for multiple distributed natural gas fire boilers to provide the base for heat. As you probably know, uh, we do not have uh, natural gas that comes to the interior region at this point in time. Uh, we're also looking at a shortage of supply of natural gas in Cook Inlet. And my questions will be uh, surrounding that as an issue. So I would uh, welcome your reply. And if we have an opportunity for further one-on-one uh, -on -one discussion, we'll do that. But I'll defer so that we can move to the next panel. Thank you, Madam Very Chairman. Good. Thank you, Senator Murkowski. Um, and thank you to all of our witnesses today. We really appreciate it. That does conclude our first panel. Uh, and we, I invite the second panel of witnesses now to take their places at the table. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much to all three of you for joining us today. Uh, I will now introduce our second panel. Uh, representing the Army is Lieutenant General Kevin Vereen, Deputy Chief of Staff, G9 Installations. From the Air Force, we have Lieutenant General Tom Miller, Deputy Chief of Staff for Logistics, Engineering, and Force Protection. And finally, Mr. Bruce Atwood, Associate <clears throat> Chief Operations Officer for the United States Space Force. We will ask our witnesses now to begin our opening statements. We will begin with General Vereen, followed by General Miller, and then Mr. Hollywood. So, General. 
Chairwoman Murray, uh, Ranking Member Bozeman, distinguished members of this subcommittee, thank you for allowing us to speak today. And thank you for allowing me to speak about the Army's military construction budget request for fiscal year 2024. I do want to thank you for your support to our Army and to our families. We are grateful as an Army for the support that we've received from, con from Congress. The Army's 2024 uh, MILCON budget request reflects a balanced investment across the Army's priorities of people and readiness with an eye towards modernization. Our total mil MILCON request for FY24 is $2.75 billion, which are applied in the following areas. $386 million to Army Family Housing. $305 million to Army Family Housing Construction. $1.747 billion to Military Construction for the Army. $107 million to Military Construction for the Army Reserve. $340 million to Military Construction for the Army National Guard. And $151 million to support BRAC. In the Indo-PACOM region, the Army has MCA investments of $1.3 billion through FY19 through FY23. And the Army has a FIDEP plan for over $2 billion of investments in the Indo-PACOM region. I want to briefly highlight the areas of readiness, quality of life, and resilience as integral parts to our Army and its ability to fight and win both now and in the future. With regards to readiness, Army investments to improve capabilities in infrastructure, training, our ranges, facilities, in the industrial base, maintenance facilities, and power projection allows us to meet the training demand and posture for any contingency across the world. In quality of life, four major areas that we have directed uh, an, an impact to our readiness. One is barracks. With Congress's support, we've increased the sustainment to 92%. We've spent $2.7 billion in FY22 to 23, and the Army plans to invest $11 billion in MILCON and F F FSRM for barracks over FYs 24 through 32, which equates to $1 billion over the next 10 years. In family housing, we've invested $928 million in government. Of targeted investments with facility sustainment restoration and modernization, to address facility condition and military construction to increase capacity. Generous congressional support in FY22 and 23 accelerated the progress of several child care development centers and dormitory projects, and we're actively working to design additional projects for inclusion in future budget submissions. I'd be remiss if I didn't address the importance of on-time appropriations and the impact continuing resolutions have. A year-long CR would prohibit, would prohibit or impact the execution of 42 military construction projects for active guard and reserve totaling $1.4 billion, including projects supporting combatant commands and new weapon system bed downs. Because the Air Force fights from its installations, it's crucial that we obtain consistent funding to operate key facilities and infrastructure, as well as build facilities for new weapon systems through construction funds. In closing, the Air Force's continued partnership with the subcommittee and its members and your dedicated staff is essential to the modernization of our assets, the safety of our installations, and the welfare of our airmen and families. I thank you for your continued support and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Mr. Hollywood. Good morning, Chair Murray, Ranking Member Bozeman, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss the Space Force Military Construction Program and other installation topics of interest. Space power is an important source of our nation's strength, both at home and abroad, and provides critical data, products, and services that enable our daily life and drive innovation in the United States and around the world. Today, military space capabilities and protection from enemy space-enabled attack are a prerequisite for success in every domain. Our peer challengers continue to aggressively develop systems to disrupt, degrade, and destroy our space capabilities. The Space Force was formed to provide resilient, ready, and combat credible space forces to ensure freedom of action and protect the United States' interests in the increasingly contested space domain. 
our Space Force infrastructure priorities are guided by the Secretary of the Air Force's operational imperatives and the Chief of Space Operations lines of effort. Our installation investments through military construction and operations and maintenance funding are especially critical because the bulk of our forces accomplish their wartime mission from their home station. Our installations are our power projection platforms that require resiliency against natural and man-made threats. Our Space Force installations also serve as home to many of our guardians, airmen, and families. We work tirelessly to provide them a comfortable and safe place to work and live. Someone much wiser than me once remarked that you recruit the warrior but retain the family. Thank you for your continuing focus on quality of life initiatives that help us retain these passionate and talented professionals. They are our most important operational advantage. To remain a lean service as Congress directed, the Space Force leverages current Air Force installation support processes. We are active partners in all the department's facility and infrastructure readiness initiatives. The fiscal year 24 United States Space Force military construction priorities are at Patrick Space Force Base Florida, a commercial vehicle inspection facility and completion of the Consolidated Communication Center, each for $15 million and security gate improvements for $12 million. We've also prioritized just over $90 million for planning and design to mature our projects through the military construction process and provide accurate estimates. Thank you for the substantial fiscal year 23 MILCON plus up. The Space Force requested just over $98 million and received over $291 million in appropriations. Our fiscal year 23 projects include over $250 million in combatant command support, including a dormitory at Clear Space Force Station, Alaska, $16 million in ERSIP projects, and $11 million for planning and design. Our installation investments and our collaborative relationships across the Department of the Air Force, especially with Lieutenant Gen General Miller's office, are critical to performing our mission and to the well-being of the guardians, airmen, and families on Space Force installations. As Secretary Kendall says, one team, one fight. Thank you for your time today, and I look forward to the opportunity to testify. Semper Supra. Thank you very much to all of our witnesses. We will now begin a round of five-minute questions for our second panel. I again ask my colleagues to keep track of the clock. Stay within those five minutes. We do have votes on. Um, General Vereen, let me begin with you. Joint Base Lewis McCord has seen an increased need for housing over the last few years as more service members and their families have been stationed uh, in Tacoma. We need to make sure that our young, unaccompanied soldiers have on-base housing when they arrive so they're able to access base support services. I'm encouraged by the President's budget, it includes new barracks, and the future year's defense program includes additional barracks for uh, fiscal years 25 and 27. But I am concerned that this is not enough. How does the Army determine what is needed so quality housing will be available at JBLM, and are there any additional requirements beyond um, the two barrack projects? Chairwoman, uh, great question, and uh, I appreciate the question. So I, I recently visited for JBLM. I was just recently out there, so I'm, I'm well aware of the housing uh, situation we have at JBLM. Uh, in a perfect world uh, for JBLM, we know that um, the availability of housing is critical because there's just not an, enough um, that's outside the, the gates of JBLM. And so we're, we're committed to expanding uh, the housing uh, that exists currently on JBLM. I think uh, there's two critical things that are happening all at the same time. We're, we are, we're working to fund and build new construction that and we know that is needed uh, based on the expansion of units that are, that are coming to JBLM as well. But uh, we're really leveraging the R and M as well, the the uh, the minor military construction uh, efforts that are going on there as well. We have existing structure uh, in housing that we could uh, that we're really taking a, a, a keen look to ensure that uh, the remodeling of those homes are, are within the standards of quality um, that is ex expected for all families. Uh, having toured uh, both uh, the new and the old. Um, I am uh, comfortable, I think, with the, um, with the way forward that the housing, um, you know, the housing partners, the housing 
uh, providers are are using to to get after the extreme shortage of housing there. Uh, it's not it's not acceptable when we have uh, we know we're in a high cost area and we have young soldiers and families who have to you know venture miles away to try to find housing to accommodate them. So we're we're fully committed to JBLM, uh, and we understand that um, it, it's unlike some of the other installations where you have. Um, the low cost housing uh, or housing that's reasonable outside the, the gates. And so we're, we're going to do everything we can to expand that. Okay. With regards to the barracks, yeah. uh, we're excited about the new barracks that's going uh, be, uh, to be built there. Uh, and we're looking at using that as a test model uh, for all of the uh, future barracks, I think, as we uh, build out on the West Coast and, and both across other Army installations. Okay, I'll be tracking that closely, so yeah. thank you. Uh, General Miller, the Air Force owns and operates about 15,000 family housing units half of which are overseas, and over a third of those units are projected to be in poor or failing condition over the next five years. The budget request clearly prioritizes privatized housing projects over traditional family housing. And at a time when we are seeking to stabilize many privatized housing projects, I'm concerned that without increases to the overall request for traditional family housing, our military families overseas, are going to be asked to shoulder the burden. So how does the Air Force plan uh, to address the resources we need for family housing overseas? Thank you, Chair Murray, <clears throat> for the question. Um, housing, whether it's in the continental United States or overseas for our families, is absolutely critical. It's, it's critical um, for the all-volunteer force. I think it was described before, you know, you may recruit, but you need to retain yeah. the family. And that discussion happens around a kitchen table. Uh, the Air Force is... Uh, planning uh, 342 projects in Japan uh, this year for FY24 at $7.8 million as part of uh, a rotational uh, renovation of the existing uh, housing that is there on Japan. So there is a mix with the constraint of construction capability and not displacing too many families to go into an economy that's already challenging to find housing as they... Um, out on the economy. So we work with the uh, Pacific Air Forces on what is the right mix sequenced by year, recognizing that uh, we have to do the renovation within the constraint of the construction capability that's resident in Japan. So your point, uh, well made, that it, there's a balance of especially the vast majority of the Air Force uh, military housing is uh, in Japan. And we've the panel before us talked about all the complexity of the construction constraints that are going on in the Indo-Pacific. So very much has our attention, ma'am. Okay, thank you very much. Senator Bozeman. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Hoven has some place he's got to be. So what I'd like to do is let him go, and then I'll pick up after okay. Senator Fisher, if that's okay. Very good. Senator Hoven. Thanks, Chairman, and thanks to Vice Chairman Bozeman. Appreciate it very much. Uh, General Vereen, uh, the Jamestown Readiness Center, which houses the 817th Engineer Company, which is a sapper group, uh, has been looking to get the uh, uh, their uh, new facility, the Jamestown Readiness Center, uh, on the FIDEP since uh, 2021. Are you going to put it on the FIDEP? I, uh, Senator, I, I'm i not well-versed on the Jamestown Readiness Center. Um, Simple I yes would... would work great if you want to go with that. <laughs> Can I take it for the record? I, I mean, I'd like to uh, to report back to you. Uh, with regards to the Jamestown. It's areas. important. These outstanding soldiers need it, and I would ask yes. you to put it on the FIDEP. Absolutely. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Uh, and along that line, uh, you you all are also working on a line of communications bridge. Uh, fiscal 22 military uh, construction appropriates bill included a report language directing the Army National Guard to establish a dedicated training pipeline for the line of communications bridge. Camp Grafton Training Center in North Dakota will soon be the only location outside of U.S. Army Engineering School at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, with the ability to train soldiers and guardsmen on every type of bridging unit in the Army's inventory. So you need a line of, com uh, line of communications bridge, uh, training facility. Um, my question is, will Army prioritize projects to include lodging and facilities that support uh, a world-class training uh, that takes place at Camp Grafton to do all kind of bridge building. So that's kind of a long way of saying, are you looking at or will you look at Camp Grafton because you need this facility so you can do all kind of bridges at a location other than Fort Leonard Wood? 
Senator, we, we will. Um, I, I just I, I will tell you that our Army is, is really about uh, the total Army. Uh, all of our components are critical to how we operate. And if we have a facility that, that um, facilitates the combined training efforts of, of all of our components, it's very important and critical for, for the Army. So we will take a look at it. Yeah, yes. but you've been directed to look at right. it in legislation. So yes. the directives you get from the Congress are also of importance to you, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Very important. And we, yeah, and this so is an existing facility. So you remember that you got both active duty and guard, and you got to train them both. Yes. So you're talking about having only one facility. Without adding a facility, this would give you two mm -hmm. and would be in line with a directive you were given by Congress. Absolutely. So your response to that would be what? We, we will adhere to the requirement from Congress. You'll take a look at it? Yes. Th thank you, sir. Yes. I appreciate it. Uh, and then Lieutenant Miller, um, weapons generation facility. So the only uh, pop quiz, what's the only dual nuclear base you have in the United States Air Force's arsenal? My non-Air Force base. Good for you, <clears throat> too. Um, and you are building weapons generation facilities at a lot of units around the country. I think maybe even one in Arkansas, Vice Chairman, I'm not sure. But at the only dual nuclear base you have in the country, you're using an old facility. And when I ask you all about this, you say, well, it's complicated because some just have ALCMs, which are soon to be LRSOs, and some just have ICBMs, which are soon to be GBSDs. But you have both. And so, you know, we're working on it. But given that we have both, wouldn't it be a priority to get going on it, particularly when the one we have is an older one? So are you going to make enhancements while we bring online LRSO and GBSD? And are you going to get going on a weapons generation facility at Minot Air Force Base? Senator, thank you for the question. Um, I just walked through the F.E. Warren weapons generation facility. As you described, single mission, missile only, um, right. uh, about a month ago. Uh, walking through and seeing the complexity of that, and, and you described a little bit, and I know the Air Force has testified prior, that to learn the, the lessons from the missile only or the bomber only to be able to do the most complex, which I really do believe will be at Minot, to be able to cover both missions. There is a congressional uh, reporting requirement that uh, the staff work that is, uh, it's a classified briefing that's on its way to your office. It's in final staffing, which I think addresses the interim uh, question that you have of what are we gonna do to sustain the weapons storage area now for Minot as, as until the weapons generation facility for both in the future is made. Unfortunately, it's a classified uh, document, sir. So as it's, it's in final stages right now, I've seen a portion of it. I think it will answer your question and I will follow up on the timeline when it's delivered and get with your staff and, and you if you wish, sir. To well, I'm a member of the Defense Probes Committee too, so I'll, I'll certainly look at that. Uh, y'all been studying, you know, y'all been implement or updating other weapons generation facilities and keep giving us this, well, we need to study it because you're both so smart. We need to go from that to, to getting it done. And so, again, I emphasize that, uh, uh, the need to get that done. But I will take a look at that report. And, again, thank you uh, both to the chairman and the vice chairman. And, gentlemen, thank you for what you do for our country. We really appreciate you. Thank you. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've been to Minot, and I'm sure uh, Senator Hoven meant to invite you, General, to also come to Minot. And uh, he, he is a good host there with, uh, obviously, a lot of pride in what, in what happens at Minot to keep our country safe. So thank you. Uh, General Miller, I'd, I'd like to ask you um, what I asked the previous panel. When we're looking at improving our posture in the Indo-Pacific, um, what specifically in your budget um, for MILCON support it is going to provide that deterrence there? You mentioned Sentinel, which I appreciate. You, you mentioned the B-21 bomber, which I appreciate. Modernization of all three legs of the triad are um, tremendously important and need to be kept on schedule. There's a little concern there, um, so we need to make sure that we can keep those on schedule. But what specifically in this budget is going to help? 
Thank you, Senator. And the only time I've ever been to Minot was in January. So it was a, it was oh, a great trip. Oh, not, not good. It was a great trip. <laughs> it was. Uh, so for, for the Indo-Pacific in, uh, uh, broadly, uh, from your previous question, uh, BASA, uh, Darwin, Jort Region, Marianas, Anderson, Kadena, three projects at Tyndall, Australia, three projects at Tinian, and, and actually two projects at Kadena. So $574 million uh, in the FY24 across those 12 projects. And I, I think the, and the, the committee has already addressed the concern um, over what's the sequencing of that. And it's, it's got to be in accordance with the supported commander. So the Indo-PACOM commander, in our case, the PACAF commander. Actually, uh, Mr. Hollywood and I just had the opportunity about a month ago to go to Guam. Uh, and to see and to talk to the Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps uh, missions that are there and the competing requirements, the H-2B visa P, uh, discussion, incredibly um, important for not causing delays for both. Um, because you can get, if you have the workforce and then you incur a delay in supply chain to get the materials there, you will lose the workforce to a higher need. So I hope, I hope that gives a somewhat of a flavor across Indo-PACOM. Okay, thank you. General Vereen, do you have any uh, comments on what the Army's uh, doing in order to make sure we have that deterrence in the, in the Indo-Pacific region in this budget? Yes, Senator, uh, uh, really uh, good course question, and thank you. I think in, uh, uh, for the Army, we, we definitely are we're challenged with some of the same uh, constraints and concerns that the other services, uh, first and foremost. Um, this is a, it's going to be a coordinated effort, I think, in the Indo-PACOM to ensure that, you know, we don't overburden um, the island chains uh, that, are, that are there. Uh, and for us, it's going to be significant as we focus primarily in, in the, uh, on, on Guam. That's, that's the significant growth with regards to the Army. And uh, if we look at, uh, if we, looking at the current budget the way we have it, um, there's about $800 million that we have projected uh, which will give us, um, we'll, which will cover 11 of our sites that we currently are considering in Guam uh, and, a, and a headquarters, a C2 element there as well. Uh, but again, we are going to be challenged by, you know, by capacity workforce uh, and trying to synchronize uh, with the other services to, to be able to get um, our, you know, our facilities built uh, and, and using the, the workforce that, um, that is very concerning as well. Uh, to uh, to complete projects, so uh, we we're we're comfortable where we are now, uh, but we also know that uh, delays will cause us to have to shift, uh, and of course um, we may not necessarily be able to stay on timeline. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, uh, General Miller. I appreciate the Air Force's commitment to rebuilding off it uh, after the devastation caused by the floods in 2019, and while the Air Force is making strong progress executing the funding that Congress has provided through the Natural Disaster Recovery Fund to rebuild what was lost to the floods. I remain concerned that the Air Force has not adequately prioritized the FRSM funding to renovate the former STRATCOM headquarters. Um, right now we have 32 organizations and over 1,500 personnel uh, to move out of buildings on Offutt that are slated to be demolished, uh, like a World War II bomber factory, and move into that re renovated office space. So do you commit to working with me to find a path forward for that project? Yes, Senator. <clears throat> the focus of Offutt, especially since the spring of 19 when that flood occurred, I was actually at Air Combat Command as the A4 then, which Offutt, of course, you know, the 55th Wing yep. is in Air Combat Command. And although I don't have the FSRM dollars specifically um, to address your question right now, absolutely, we'll, we'll continue to commit. And the, the generosity of this subcommittee for national disaster recovery uh, for both Tyndall, for Offit, and to be able to provide also facilities. Also in Virginia. At, yeah. at Langley uh, has been absolutely game-changing and going to give combat capability to three F-35 squadrons um, coming first aircraft arrival within the next year. Great. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Bozeman. You are. Uh, yes. Uh, in, in the interest of, of time, um, I'm going to be very brief because we got a vote going on. I've had the opportunity to visit with you all, and we do appreciate your hard work and the fact that you're moving things forward. I want to thank Senator Murray for 
uh, emphasizing the quality of life issues. Those are very important to her. I appreciate her leadership. It's really important to all of us. Very quickly, General Miller, the Air Force budget primarily supports new weapon systems and combatant commanders, leaving only $320 million out of the total $2.6 billion budget to support the current mission portfolio. With so much of the budget going to competing priorities, how how is the Air Force getting after critical recapitalization projects with only 12 percent of your budget available for those kind of purposes? How can we help you? We uh, important piece to us having a the design, the planning and design that makes a project mature enough so that the subcommittee can help us actually is a part is a lot of what the work the Air Force needs to do. So there's high confidence in the projects we bring forward and we put in the budget so they can be executed and we don't have to have additional cost to complete requests. So we are looking at the balance of uh, dormitories, CDCs, uh, Indo-Pacific, nuclear enterprise, and Europe. And I think a key homework for us is to make sure we're pouring the MILCON planning and design money in to make those projects mature enough so that they can be appropriated for. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator thank you. Murkowski. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Um, General Miller, one of the uh, one of the capability gaps that we've, of course, been talking about in Alaska is the need for aerial refuelers in, in Alaska. So, of course, we're very pleased about the um, four additional KC-135s there to be staged at, at Eielson, um, great expansion to our capabilities. So that's, that's good news. Uh, unfortunately, we've, we've learned that these aircraft um, are perhaps a little sensitive to the tough temperatures there in, in the interior. Uh, four came up for a winter training exercise. Apparently, two were um, a little bit dead on arrival due to the maintenance issues caused by the environment there. So it certainly leads me to believe that in order to make the basing of the KC-135s successful, additional hangar space is going to be needed. So for the record, can you speak to the need for hangar space there at Eielson and why having to wait 24 hours to, to thaw these aircraft um, after they've been stored outside perhaps uh, doesn't help us with our readiness issue? Thank you, Senator, for that question. For KC-135s, you know, as you described, mid-60s production uh, for those aircraft and the environment that they operate in. It is, a, it is a struggle for vast temperature changes. Unfortunately, I don't have the information with me about plans for hangars for those four additional 135s, but if I could take that for the record and get back with your staff or you, I can do that. I, I, go ahead and do that, but I, I guess just generally, do you think that we need some hangars up there in order to keep these, these important uh, aircraft um, really at the ready in the winter. Yes, ma'am. We've focused a, largely on the fighter force, especially for, uh, for Ielsen, and I'm not familiar with, uh, I know we operate KC-135s in cold environments, not Ielsen level of cold. Right. So, uh, yes, ma'am, I'm committed to go back and do the homework and look at, if, are there any lessons we've learned from a weapon system, health perspective, pre-warming? I know there are some technologies where we pre-warm B-52s, uh, at Minot, where there's an entire apparatus that pre-warms some of the avionics and the engines to get rid of some of the challenges that you're describing where an airplane is not functional when it first arrives, but I'll go do that homework, ma'am. Well, we'd, we'd appreciate that for the record and just recognize that it's not just pre-warming the aircraft, but it's, it's, those, uh, it's those individuals that have to then get into that aircraft. Uh, another one uh, that I would like to raise, uh, when we were looking at Air Force's unfunded priorities list for, for FY24, on that list was an expansion of the Alaska Air National Guard's alert crew facility there at J Bear. Can you explain how this facility could improve the capabilities of the Air Guard? You know, they've got a pretty significant mission there when it comes to rescue operations, um, both in, in combat and for, for civil support operations. Thank you, Senator, for that question. For As you, I'm sure, are well aware, alert commitments are um, one of the most important functions that any airman can provide, because that is the last, the last minute, very close to the proximity of the aircraft from a sleeping command and control, 
uh, aircraft availability. The I, I'll get with our Air National Guard, uh, my counterpart, to look at the, the funding profile and the plan for that specific facility, but the importance of having the National Guard ready at, at the ready for immediate launch uh, could not be more important to our national defense. Thank you. We certainly, certainly concur with that. Um, General Vereen, um, as I had looked through the requests for MILCON projects um, uh, in the budget or the unfunded priorities list, um, I really didn't see much that indicated uh, moving out or leaning in on implementation of either the Army's Arctic strategy or the national strategy for the Arctic region. Can you share with me whether the Army does have plans to use MILCON funding to enhance the cap or the ability to carry out the Arctic strategies? Senator, um, thank you for the question. Um, I, my first answer would be yes. Um, we, we do have um, you know, a way forward to ensure that we meet the requirements of the Arctic the strategy itself. I think when uh, we look at you know, Alaska, uh, with your help, we've, we've had significant when it comes to some of the infrastructure we've been able to, to see uh, come on board since, uh, F, since FY18 has been pretty, uh, pretty, pretty good. We we've, we've really, really appreciate your support there. Um, what we have in 23 with two barracks facilities coming online uh, and some R&M projects as well, uh, I think we'll be able to expand. We know we've got to expand capacity because of the shifting of some of our forces uh, and growth in Alaska. And then I think if you look at in FY's 24 through 32, there's 13 projects there as well um, that that uh, signifies the growth uh, and the shifting to support the Arctic strategy. So we, we are we are in, a, I think, a good place. Uh, of course, uh, we just want to make sure that we keep on the timeline to ensure that the expansion and the growth and the transfer of units from uh, other parts of the, you know, of our uh, installations to Alaska will be able to accommodate them uh, in, in, a, in a right manner. Good. Well, again, <clears throat> we've been placing a lot of priority on that and, and just want to make sure, again, that we're all leaning in. Madam Chairman, I know that you spoke to, to uh, those matters that improve quality of life. And um, while I didn't see a lot uh, identified in uh, Army's budget for Alaska this year, we know, of course, we're very focused on on the suicide issues that we have seen up north, everything that we can do to help address that. And we, we believe, we understand that improvements to certain facilities can certainly increase the quality of life for, for those that are, are stationed there in Alaska. So we had, a great, um, we had a great visit by the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, the Surgeon General of the Army, uh, went out to Fort Wainwright, uh, have an opportunity to see and, and understand better. If you need a personal invitation to come on up, uh, we would certainly in, invite you to do so. We'll take you for the three-mile walk from the outdated barracks there to the two small dining room in, in the dark. Uh, come in January, we'll give you some 30 below temps. But um, we, I think we know that we've got a little bit more to be doing there when it comes to quality of life in Alaska for our soldiers. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Um, I, I will submit for the record several questions. Uh, since I do have to get over for a vote, Mr. Hollywood, I do want to hear from you, uh, and I'll submit it for the record, how you're going to, uh, how your, what your installation investment strategy is and how you're going to uh, allocate your resources directly. And then both to General Vereen and General Miller, we, I asked PFAS questions to the first panel. I will ask you, for the record, the same question. Uh, what resources do you need so we can expedite this process and, um, and get us, uh, you know, what, what you're going to need for that, for the record? I'd appreciate it. With that, that will end our hearing today, and I want to thank all of our witnesses and all of our colleagues for participating. I look forward to working together on this year's appropriations bills to make sure we are providing the department service members and their families with the military construction and family housing resources they need. Finally, I will keep this hearing record open for one week. Committee members who would like to submit written questions for the record should do so by 5 o'clock p.m. Wednesday, April 26. We appreciate the department responding to them in a reasonable period of time. With that, we stand adjourned.